You sleep rather soundly for a murderer. That's good. You'll need a clear conscience for what I'm about to propose. I'll never forget the first time I had this encounter. I remember finding some innocent man out camping in the mountains with his dog. I think I mistook him for a bandit or something, and when the message popped up that my murder had been witnessed, I thought that meant I was going to gain a bounty. I was surprised when the guards didn't hunt me down in the Imperial City and sort of forgot about the whole thing until Lucy and Lachance greeted me as I awoke. I always thought that was an interesting way to get into a guild. Like the Thieves Guild that actually requires us to do some stealing for us to get in, or at least one of the methods anyhow. The Dark Brotherhood requires us to commit a murder in order to be invited to join. It immediately establishes the tone for the guild through the player's experiences and not because some dialogue or text box tells us so. This first conversation with Lucien Lachance is forever burned into my brain. I can recall most of it verbatim, and for good reason, it's just awesome. It's corny and cliche, but for some reason, between the voice acting, the robes, and the fact that some unknown entity has been watching us kill and Lachance has been literally watching us sleep, the whole conversation just immediately hooks me. I'll be the first to admit the Dark Brotherhood is definitely the guild designed for the edgy teenager that I was back when I first played the game. It's almost cartoonishly evil to me now that I'm older, and while still edgy, I at least I'm a little bit more aware of it. It's not the edgy cool factor that makes it rank so highly for me these days. No, it's, it's more valid than that, at least. So let's really start getting into this thing. The chance offers us a rare opportunity to ply our unique gift for taking life without pity or remorse. If we want to join this elite super secretive family of unscrupulous killers, we need to perform another act of murder, but this time less wanted and more targeted. Staying at the Inn of Ill Omen, which is a great name for an inn I must say, who wouldn't want to stay at such a welcoming place? There lives an old man named Rufio. Our task is to make him not living. We can accept or refuse, though I don't actually know what happens if you say you aren't a murderer, because why would we choose that if we aren't trying to join a guild of assassins? This game has programmed me to dismiss dialogue options, as they never really had any sort of impact on gameplay. The Dark Brotherhood, despite having more options than any of the other quest lines, upholds that tradition. My guess is that they just had them for added roleplaying. Anyways, down at the Inn of Ill Omen, where it's happy hour all hours, we find out Rufio has been living here for some time and spends most of his time sleeping in the basement alone, never coming up to mingle with the people of the inn. The innkeep isn't sure what his deal is, but he pays his tab and that's all that really matters. Well, you might as well alert the housekeeping staff and fetch an undertaker because you're about to have a corpse down there instead of a patron. We head down and do the simple deed and stroll on out, nobody none the wiser. The next time we sleep in a bed that Lachance deems safe, he materializes and congratulates us on a job well done, and welcomes us into this dysfunctional but beautiful family. He instructs us to make it to Shaden Hall where we will find an abandoned house with a unique door in the basement. It will ask us a question, to which we just simply respond, Sanguine, my brother, and open sesame, we are in. It's kind of weird how homey and safe the sanctuary feels. It actually feels more welcoming than any of the other guild halls, I gotta admit. The place has a very communal vibe to it, and despite on the surface it looking like a tomb of sorts, there's some touches like rugs and furniture that makes it feel lived in. And everyone is actually incredibly nice and welcoming. For a group of cold-blooded killers, they really have a sense of loyalty. It's immediately obvious that the whole family thing is taken quite literally by these people, and that starts to lay the groundwork for what truly makes this guild so brilliant. We are greeted by Ochiva, the self-described mistress of the sanctuary. She runs the sanctuary for the most part and is a very welcoming lady. She's delighted to have us here, but we won't be working directly with her just yet. Vincenti Valtieri will be giving us our beginning contracts. Going down to see him, we learn he's actually a vampire, but like everyone else, he's a very domesticated hunter of the night, and even promises to offer us a chance to inherit the dark gift as soon as we prove ourselves in the guilt. Um, I'm good. Thanks, though. He explains the way contracts work, which are, like any other guilds, kind of just quests. But contracts have a twist. So the Mage's Guild and the Fighter's Guild gave very simple quests that just involve fetching items, talking to people, or killing baddies in dungeons. So they didn't really have to take that annoying thing called player agency into account when making the quests. The Thieves Guild and the Dark Brotherhood are different beasts though, where quests on the surface follow similar lines but in fact are much more open-ended. 
The problem is that a lot of players will take the path of least resistance, and the other quests prove that that path is just killing and looting everything until the journal says you've done good. So the good guilds had to figure out a way to get the players to actually engage with the mechanics and content in a way that will be more satisfying than just shooting and looting. The Thieves Guild had rules. You can't kill people in jobs or else you pay a blood price, which was usually around 1k gold. And you would gain bounties in cities because most of the quests took place in cities. The Dark Brotherhood had to take a different approach because, well, killing people is the whole point of the guild. So instead we have bonuses if certain parameters are met. Let me explain. So the Dark Brotherhood aren't some thugs you give 100 gold on the street to bludgeon your nemesis to death. They are a very professional organization. There's a structure, procedures, and policies. People perform a ritual to the Night Mother, the true head of the organization, and she in turn hears their prayers for murder who relays this to her listener. And he or she then dispatches representatives to work out the details of the contract with the person performing the ritual and receives payment. These people aren't going through all this trouble because they want the Dark Brotherhood to murder the target any old way. There's usually specifics to deflect suspicions or to send a message. They go to the Dark Brotherhood because they have a reputation for being extremely exact, pulling their contracts and the details prescribed. See, we could go through each quest just slaughtering everyone and forgoing the stealth and thought needed to figure out the puzzles the designers set up for us, but that will not only rob us of a satisfying experience, that will also forego our bonus. And this isn't just some worthless gold, no, these are actually very powerful and useful magical artifacts that are very relevant to a stealthy assassin character. You want the goods? Stick to the script. You might be thinking, you've been complaining about quests that steal agency from the player, now you're complimenting a guild that just does that. Make up your mind. It's true, this is technically depriving the player of their agency, but in order to make quests, the player must in some manner give up some agency. Quests are where an open world game is given some structure. That structure, by its very nature, deprives the player of some freedoms. The key is not to ask them to surrender too much of that freedom, and this is the even more important part, to properly reward them for that compromise with either in-game rewards or better yet with an enjoyable gameplay or story experience. If the player doesn't surrender enough agency, they are going to find ways to circumvent the neat little ride you as a game designer have taken the time to construct for them, no matter how enjoyable that ride is. That's human nature. Aside from some fringe cases and players coming back for a second go around, most people will select the path of least resistance, and that's usually pretty well ingrained in them after, say, 30 hours in game. They are going to have habits that the rest of the game has instilled in them, and those habits are likely not to be what you want them bringing into this to cruise through it. A quest is meant to challenge, ideally, and if they can snooze through it by doing exactly what they've been doing for 30 hours already, they aren't going to find a challenge. And you want a challenge because that's what delivers a satisfying gameplay experience. That's literally the underlying principles of games, be they tabletop, video games, or the physical variety. Overcoming adversity is satisfying, and the act of overcoming those challenges can provide moments of fun. Even in a story-rich game where challenge isn't the key, the challenge there is then navigating a world and having your mental expectations challenged and subverted. Something about the experience must be novel. So yeah, even your walking simulators need to have a challenge in their design. This is why so many of the quests in Oblivion are just so fucking dull. They don't challenge because the designers were afraid to ask players to commit to a style of play, and with that very difficult to meet parameter, they found the most consistent formula was just drop in dungeons full of enemies and use combat to carry the experience. Except like I said in the first video, combat in this game sucks, and even if it didn't, copying the exact quest formula across 200 quests will get stale. This is why we get bonuses in the Dark Brotherhood. Because when it comes to conditioning human behavior, you can generally do so in one of two ways. Punish people for coloring outside of the lines, or incentivizing the preferred behavior. The Thieves Guild took the former route with its blood price fines, while the Dark Brotherhood went the latter route with bonuses. I'm generally a much bigger fan of incentives as opposed to punishments, but that's, that's a different discussion, let's just move on from that. So why didn't I complain about the blood price in the Thieves Guild? Well, by virtue of the guild being so much better than anything else in the game up until the Dark Brotherhood, just the intrinsic value of having fun was enough to get me to comply to its rules. I didn't need the threat of the blood price to get me to follow them. See, the Thieves Guild gets an enormous boost to its perceived quality due to the fact that it exists in a game that has the Mage's Guild. 
had the other guilds been as well designed as it and the Dark Brotherhood, I would have come across that blood price as a less compelling disincentive as the Dark Brotherhood's bonuses. But I had to wade through the Mage's Guild's bullshit, so the Thieves' Guild got a huge pass for a lot of its shortcomings just because it trusted that I had a brain. But uh, we just got on a big tangent there, so let's get back on track. We get our first four contracts with Valtieri, and they're all quite simple in scope and objective. The first contract has us sneaking aboard a pirate ship and murdering its captain. Valtieri takes a lot of the thought out of this one by just telling us, yeah, there's some cargo boxes on the docks, you should use them to get smuggled aboard. In the future, the optimal path or the hidden shortcuts won't be nearly as obvious. If we ask our fellow guildmates about our contracts, they might spell those things out a little bit more clearly, so you might want to avoid doing that despite what Valtieri suggests if you want to figure things out for yourself. So we head to the Imperial City Waterfront District and cram ourselves into a little crate conveniently left open on the dock. Just in case you weren't listening to Valtieri earlier and needed another heavy-handed hint. This is a tutorial assassination quest, so these gestures are easily forgiven, and the quest is incredibly short. Once aboard the ship, we gotta sneak through and avoid the crew, which is very easy to accomplish with all the rooms and doors we can duck into. We get to overhear some conversations between the pirates, which gives us some flavor and humor, and even suggests who might have set up the contract with the Dark Brotherhood in the first place. I told you a million times, it wasn't my fault. The wheel was covered with gold droppings. My hand slipped. It could have happened to anyone. The dialogue is also used to signal to us when it's safe to move through the hold. Once the coast is clear, we reach the captain's quarters and get rid of him, which is actually a little challenging because he fights back, unlike Rufio who just slept his way into the abyss. With the captain dead and the crew loudly banging on the door asking what's going on, we dip out the back and book it back to the sanctuary for our reward and our bonus. The second quest is similar to the first in that it's pretty simple, and Valtieri spells out the method quite explicitly. We are to sneak into a man's house and loosen the braces that hold up the stuffed animal head that hangs over his favorite chair as he sits between certain hours during the evening. This is meant to be staged to look like an accident and his manservant Grom is to be unharmed. Other than that though, the details are left for us to figure out, such as how to get into the house undetected. Reconning the area around the manor reveals a door to the cellar, giving us access to a discreet route to the bedroom where behind a board we find the braces. A quick undoing of the fastenings drops the thing onto the dude's head, causing a commotion below. As we sneak out, we can see Grom standing over the body of his dead master, so we gotta slip out before he notices the assassin sneaking by the doorway. Job done, bonus earned, nice. Third contract and following the pattern is more open-ended. It's also one of my personal favorite quests of the game. This one tasks us with assassinating a Dunmer prisoner in the Imperial Prison, Valen Dreth. You might remember him as being the ass who antagonizes you at the beginning of the game. Well, someone wants him dead, and I can't possibly imagine why. There's a secret way into the prison, a way Valtieri implies we know quite well. So long as we kill Dreth and leave the guards alone, we get our bonus. I love this quest for several reasons. First, I'm a sucker for developers having us return to the very beginning levels again, but with some kind of twist. That feeling of things coming full circle, returning but more powerful and with different motives really instills a satisfying sense of progression that is nice to be reminded of from time to time. The second reason this quest is great is that it's the first of the Brotherhood quests that involves a lot of sneaking around characters who are likely to detect us. The previous two quests had some sneaking, but we were never in any real danger of being detected. This quest has guards on patrol, and while it's not super challenging, especially for a character like mine with a high sneak skill, it still requires some thought and attention. We gotta be on the lookout and frequently hold back as guards disperse and duck into dark corners as a patrol comes by. It really makes it feel like you're an actual assassin. The third reason I love this quest is just antagonizing Dreth. We get some amazing dialogue between the guard and Dreth, and I'm almost positive this guard is the one who set the contract up. Who else even knows this sad sap exists aside from us and the guard here? Dreth is obviously unstable and shouldn't be out in the streets, and the fact that we can't harm any guards leads me to my conclusion. Eleven! Eleven years in this rat-infested hole! But I'm getting out, and you'll still be stuck in here! Yeah! <laughs> oh yeah? Where will you go, huh? What will you do? You can't survive out there, Dreth. You're an animal. You belong in that cage. I'll remember that when I'm lying on the beaches of Somerset Isle with your wife, you imperial pig. Right! And you'll be rich, too. Oh, and you'll become a king. And you know what I think, Dreth? 
I think you'll be back. You lot always come back. You'll see, you Imperial dog. When I get out of here, all of Tamria will know my name. Valen Dreth. Valen Dreth. All right, all right. I'm tempted to let you out right now if you just shut up. Anyway, once the guard is done tormenting Dreth one last time, it's our turn. Wait, I, I know you. You, you're the one. The, the day the Emperor was killed. They went through your cell. You lucky bastard. But you came back? Come on, you've got to help me. Let old Valen out of this cell. You've got your freedom, now give me mine. What do you say, huh? Come on, friend. The Night Mother... No, no, guards, guards, help me. Somebody help, assassin. Run away. Valtteri was right, it is satisfying. We then swipe the keys to the place and just stroll out like we're some passing civilian. Absolutely brilliant. Back in Shaden Hall, we pick up our fourth and final Valtteri contract. This one isn't an assassination at all, but helping a man stage his own death to get out of a debt. He borrowed from the wrong people and they really just want him dead, so this guy paid the Brotherhood a great deal of gold to stage his death before the hitman comes and actually does it. We are to make it look like we are there to kill the man, and using a special poison make it look like he is actually dead. The hope is the hitman will think the job is done and go and tell his employers, and that will buy our employer some time to sneak out of Cyrodiil once we've given him the antidote to revive him. My favorite detail is how the Dark Brotherhood doesn't ordinarily do these sorts of jobs because... The Dark Brotherhood is not in the business of staging deaths, no matter how much gold is offered. Sithis demands blood and blood must be paid. In order to accept the contract, we demanded a life. Motiere offered his mother, and we accepted. Lucien has already taken care of that uh, detail. There really isn't much to this quest, should be told. There's very little we can do except go to Coral and do as we're told. The dialogue makes up for some of it, though, and it is a very brief quest, so I don't mind it too much. It helps show the Dark Brotherhood is a very multifaceted organization that is willing to take on very unique requests so long as it involves life and death. It's a neat diversion and serves to bookend our tutorial-ish contracts with Valtieri. It all goes off without a hitch and we get our bonus. Easy peasy. In the meantime, we also grab a quest from one of our guildmates. It's not technically part of the guild, but it falls within the general vibe of the guild. Tanava reveals he and Ochiva were Shadow Scales back in Black Marsh. Shadow Scales are taken once they are hatched to train in the arts of assassination to carry out duties in service to the royal powers down there. The two of them trained with a third, Scartail. Well, Scartail never left Black Marsh and continued to serve as a Shadow Scale, but dishonored his vows and bailed on a job, fleeing to Cyrodiil. Because Shadow Scales are forbidden from killing each other, he needs to contract us to do the job. All we need to do is bring Scartail as hard as proof. Being loyal to our fellow guildmates and bound by the honorable code of being cold-hearted killers, we accept and head down to the edge of Cyrodiil where Scartail is hiding. When we get there, we find he's already weakened and unarmed, having barely fought off a royal assassin from Black Marsh already. He offers to pay us off in exchange for his life, and we can bring the heart of the Argonian assassin into Tanava as proof. I agree only to learn of the location of his stash and then kill him and cut out his heart because we wouldn't be good assassins if we didn't live by the sadistic, merciless code of honor. Tanava is pleased and gives us some boots that are well, pretty much worthless at this point, but I love seeing the lizard smile and that's what I kill for, to bring smiles to people's faces. Our first contract with Ochiva has us hunting down a high elf named Phalian in the Imperial City. She warns us about Adamus Phillid, an Imperial watch captain who has it in for the Dark Brotherhood. If he suspects the Brotherhood committed a murder in his city, he goes out of his way to clamp down on their operations, so she insists we try to make the murder seem as inconspicuous by killing him in a remote place indoors away from any witnesses. In order to pull off this off, we will need to do some detective work. I'm not sure how I feel about this quest. On the one hand, I like having to go around town asking people about our target to locate him, and it's really cool getting to piece together an idea of what this guy's life is and his story and trying to figure out how to end it. But on the other hand, I'm left wondering a few things. 
If the whole point of us killing him away from people is to reduce suspicion, then wouldn't going around town asking everyone and their mother about Phalian going to arouse quite a bit of it? And how does killing him away from witnesses make the Brotherhood less suspect? I thought clean professional kills was what made the Brotherhood so famous. Wouldn't it actually be better to kill him in a less professional way? Never really bought the explanations for the challenges set up to justify our bonuses for this one. It always just felt less thought out than the others. Asking around town leads us to the Tiber Septon Inn, where the innkeeper tells us he lives in the hotel with his wife, who pays for everything because Falion is now a skooma addict who spends most of his time roaming the streets looking for it. We locate his wife, who, feeling like she can trust us because our magical disposition number is high with her, spills her guts about Falion and her fears about what he does all day. It's a very jarring conversation because I've never spoken to this woman before, and she just starts rattling off her worries to us like we're her mother. Thanks to her, though, we wind up learning about the abandoned house he goes to do his skooma, which sounds like the perfect place to murder him. So off it is to the place where we set up and wait for him to show up. And once he does, we discreetly kill him and skip back to the sanctuary, a job well done. It would have been more appropriate if we managed to kill him with some sort of poison skooma or something, maybe selling it to him here in the house as we pose as a skooma dealer or something. That way it just looks like an overdose as opposed to him now having an arrow in him. Maybe the idea is that people will miss the arrow sticking out of him and assume it was the drug use that did it? Or maybe it was another drug addict that did him in? I don't really know, but this quest has too many plot holes for me to really give it much credit. The second quest actually falls along this idea, though. Ochiva entrusts us with another contract to infiltrate a fort to poison a veteran and captain of a mercenary company. In order to do this, we need to sneak into the fort completely undetected and swap the medicine he is given daily with a poison. It's absolutely essential nobody sees us, which means a lot of sneaking like a good assassin should. If the last quest was a little underwhelming, this one is more fun and challenging. One of our guildmates actually gives us the location of a back way into the fort that will help us get in undetected. Following the advice, we sneak into the fort and dodge patrols, getting some dialogue between a disgruntled member of the company and a more loyal one as they discuss the unchanging condition of their leader. Ten bucks on the disgruntled underling being the one who issued the contract. Employee dissatisfaction aside, we sneak into the chamber where the captain is and swap the medicine with the poison. Then it's just a matter of sneaking back out of the fort and dodging a few more patrols in the process. This isn't a challenging quest, especially since we got a good sneak skill and detect life which lets us wall hack our enemies to time when and where we gotta move to avoid getting caught. There probably should have been a few more guards and faster patrols, but it wasn't completely straightforward, so it wasn't too boring. Do you like parties? Because you've been invited to one. Of course, you'll be killing all the other guests. Are you ready to attend? This quest is Oblivion at its absolute prime. This is what this game could achieve when every component is working together, when every aspect of what makes this game up is used. So, as Achieva explained, we are going to a party with the intent of murdering all the guests. Now, we could just go in and start hacking people to death, but that would spoil the fun and forfeit the bonus, which doesn't even make sense why it would. It's just the designer beating the player over the head saying, just don't ruin it for yourself, you jackass. Seriously, this is a quest about social engineering, and I really wish there were more quests like this. If there had been, I would have rolled a high personality and speechcraft character every single time. I would have sacrificed three other guilds if it got us a whole guild length quest chain revolving around speech. But wishful thinking aside, let's go through just one of the ways we can tackle this quest because we actually have options for this one. Go, go, socialize, talk to those fine people, and then plunge your knife into their throats when they ain't looking. <laughs> The first step is doing a little recon, getting to know our targets, or um, I mean, our fellow party guests. We first meet Matilda Petit, a supposed Breton noblewoman from High Rock, who seems just a little too eager to want this money to be a rich noblewoman. She also hates Dunmer, so uh, we may have a personal problem with this one. We also got Primo Antonis, a stuck-up rich guy who came here thinking this would just be some good old-fashioned fun. He didn't even need the money. Nels the Naughty is a Nord, and living up to the stereotype of Nords, he drinks a lot, especially when people start dropping dead in the house. And he also hates the Empire. Neville is a no-nonsense retired legionnaire with a deep hatred for Nords, making him the perfect foil for Neville. 
probably the only two people in this house who might figure out our true intentions. Then we got Devesi Dran, a fellow Dunmer. She's a sweet girl whom I spared the horror by killing her first. So it goes like this. We first play off the little crush Devosi and Primo have by convincing the girl she should go wait for Primo in his room to seduce him. Because, well, he's totally into her. He? He did? Oh my goodness, what should I do? Should I talk to him? Or maybe play hard to get? Or should I, you know... Or would that be too forward? Oh, you think so? I mean, it is rather forward, but I like it. All right, then. I'll wait for him in his room upstairs. Oh, thank you, thank you! With her hopes up and successfully isolated from the group, she makes the easiest first kill. This disturbs the rest of the guests and starts to create tension, but it's not enough yet to provoke any of them into action. Yes, the poor girl is dead! What a shame! Well, I guess she won't be finding the gold. <laughs> Primo ends up our second victim as he hangs around in the library as everyone else heads off to bed. It's uh, not the most glamorous kill, but eh, gets the job done. With two guests dead, now tensions are raised. Neville and Nels are ready to slit each other's throats, and the old lady Matilda is caught in between. Nobody suspects us yet, because despite us lacking any sort of alibi, they all trust us seeing as we charmed and bribed them all. Playing off of Neville's paranoia, we convince him to run upstairs and grab his legion gear, and now events move quickly. One less dark elf in the world. And now there's one less person to find the gold as well. It's a good day, don't you think? This leaves Matilda alone upstairs for about a quarter of a second, plenty of time to give her a taste of Marwyn justice. With Neville somehow sensing Matilda's death upstairs, he's convinced Nels did it. His hatred for Nord's so great he ignores the fact that Nels was downstairs the moment he heard the old lady's body hit the floor. Yes, yes, we must kill that foul Nord before he slits our throats. Aye! So many people... Now it's just a matter of escaping with his best buddy and, ah oh shit, he was the murderer the entire time. God damn it! The quest sort of suffers on account of Bethesda's patented AI telepathy technology, removing the thrill of posing or hiding bodies and waiting for people to make the grisly discoveries. But I get the designers were working with a very rigid AI system. Just the thought of all the possibilities having a discovery system would open up would have me replaying this quest a dozen times each playthrough. With all the guests dead and none of them ever figuring out we were the ones doing the killing, Ochiva is pleased. She actually gives us a straight permanent stat buff as a bonus. A Night Mother's Blessing. This is the sort of reward that should have been more common in the other guilds, not just worthless golden robes. Our next job is a contract sanctioned by the Black Hand itself. Adamus Philida must die. The Imperial Watch Captain has finally retired, thinking he'd won and escaped the wrath of the Dark Brotherhood by retiring to Leowin. Turns out he's wrong. Well, dead wrong, in fact. We are given the Rose of Sithis, an insta-kill if used on an unarmored target, and the instructions to kill him, cut off his finger with his Imperial Signet ring still on it, and stick it in the desk of his successor in order to score the bonus. It's brutal, it's sick, and it's pretty fucking great. So, it's off to Leowin to get it done. There's several issues that need to be resolved for this job to go smoothly. First is Adamus Philida himself. He may be retired, but he's still a well-armed and armored foe, so taking him on when he's able to fight back would complicate a clean kill. Second is that he's followed by a bodyguard most of the time, so we have to either get him away from the guard or kill him without anyone seeing us. And that's where the Rose of Sithis can come in handy. The third is that he moves around all the time and is usually in a public setting. So why don't you just go away? And finally, we need his finger for that bonus, so we will have to reveal ourselves from our sniping spot if using the rose is the route we end up going. This is generally one of the most difficult quests in the Brotherhood chain to pull off completely perfect. In fact, this might be the first time I actually managed to pull it off without incurring a bounty or starting a fight with a body card. I don't know if it was luck or if I actually did manage to do it all correctly, but it was satisfying to get a good run on camera, that's for sure. It's pretty easy to track Philida down once in Lightwind. He walks the streets in his white imperial armor, making him a very easy target to track. After that, it's simply a matter of following the man until he's in a good spot. 
Generally, the best place to catch him is when he goes to take a swim in the pond. That's when he's away from his bodyguard and without his armor. Then it's a simple matter of finding a good spot to snipe him undetected and moving quickly to snatch the finger. Once that's done, we gotta make it to the Imperial City and sneak into the office where his desk is and slip the finger into the desk, which is a task that shouldn't be underestimated, as there's guards all over the place and they don't take too kindly to assassins trying to drop severed fingers in their offices. Once it's all taken care of, it's back to the Sanctuary to deliver the news to Ochiva, who is very pleased Philida will be spending the rest of eternity being tormented by Sithis for all the headaches he's caused the Dark Brotherhood. I mean, I gotta feel bad for the guy, he was just doing his job. But I also appreciate the fact that the devs didn't try to sugarcoat this by softening the blow and making Philida some evil tyrant or something. Nah, he was just a good man and we are the evil fucks who take life without any sort of remorse. That's what it means to be a Dark Brotherhood assassin, and it could have been very easy for the devs to try and justify saving the player's soft sensibilities, but that would have ruined the true experience of playing an evil character. It's strange because Bethesda games typically don't allow players to play evil characters, even though player freedom is such a sacred pillar of their game design. They always seem to come just short of letting the players truly be free, but not with the Dark Brotherhood. There's no minced meanings here, we're just bad people doing bad deeds. Even the Thieves' Guild had some altruistic components to them. The Dark Brotherhood is really the only bastion for evil bastards. Speaking of evil bastards, Lucian Lachance has need of us, sending us a sealed letter when we see Oshiva. Whatever it is, according to the letter, it is extremely urgent, and we shouldn't tell anyone we are going to see him at a secret hideaway just outside of Shadenhall. This is where I began to believe in the greatness that is a high sneak skill, and I began to suspect stealth was actually just a little bit broken now making reaching with Chance in his fort kind of easy. He informs us the Shadenhall Sanctuary has been compromised by a traitor. The traitor has been operating for some time before we even joined the guild, so we have been absolved of any suspicions, but the rest of the Sanctuary is not so fortunate. Everyone else is suspect, and because of that, the Black Hand has authorized the Rite of Purification. Everyone in the Sanctuary must die. It's a drastic measure that has only been done twice in the history of the Brotherhood, but it's through drastic measures from time to time that the organization has managed to survive for so long. The idea is that if everyone in the Sanctuary is purged, the traitor will be among those killed. Think of it like amputating a limb to save a patient's life if you're feeling macabre. All the souls of the Sanctuary will be offered to the Sithis as a sign of fealty, which sounds like a real rotten deal for those involved, unless Sithis shows some mercy to his devoted children. But something tells me the god known as the Dreadfather torments souls indiscriminately. Reservations aside, it is our duty to the Dark Brotherhood to carry out the task. We are elevated to the rank of Silencer and will be Lucian Lachance's right hand moving forward. As an official member of the Black Hand, many of the tenants that bound us previously have been lifted, so long as we serve the Black Hand and Sithis. So it's back to Shadenhall to get it done. The best way to go about this is isolating each member and taking them down one at a time. They are all masters of combat and are usually armed and armored, so using stealth is absolutely the way to go unless we want to alert the whole sanctuary and get mobbed to death. One of our guildmates spends her time in a private room in the upstairs of an inn in town, so she's the easiest one to target first. A sneak attack with an arrow does a trick and then it's time to head to the sanctuary for a more methodical deconstruction. Lucian gave us a single poison apple, which is great, but if we want to speed this up, we need more. So we grab all the poison apples we can and clear out all the food in the living quarters and replace it with poison apples. Then it's just a matter of waiting and seeing what happens. This is absolutely a very inefficient way of killing the sanctuary, but it is satisfying watching NPCs get killed by their radiant AI routines. It's worth a try at any rate. Grom is the first to taste the forbidden fruit, and thankfully so, he's probably the only one who would have been a real bitch to fight. He falls over like a sack of potatoes after a few bites, and then sort of just lays there for two days, as no one seems to notice or care. Once again, the limitations of Bethesda's AI is pretty obvious in this quest, and it makes the thrill of killing all of them rather muted. None of them realize they're in any sort of mortal danger unless they see us attacking someone in front of them, even as the bodies of their guildmates start to litter the halls of the sanctuary. Valtteri is up next as he spends most of his time alone at the bottom of the sanctuary in his private room. So we sneak up on him as he sleeps and cut him a few times with a fiery dagger, which is his weakness as a vampire. Marshdar dies somewhere off camera and I was never able to find his body. 
He no doubt ate an apple himself and died in some unknown location. Ochiva goes to train in the training hall by herself, so a stealthy poison arrow does a trick there. The remaining two are then pretty easy kills on their own, and with that, the purification is complete. It's nothing short of hilarious that I feel more for the deaths of these evil martyrs than I do for any of the other deaths of any of the other characters in earlier quests in the game, and that's really just nothing short of an indictment on the poor writing of the previous quest chains. None of those characters, save for maybe a couple in the Thieves Guild, had any sort of development or even a personality, they were all just vehicles for some shoddy, melodramatic plots. So when St. Traven lights himself on fire, I feel nothing except maybe just a little relief I no longer have to be his errand boy. But having to kill every member of the Shaden Hall Sanctuary feels kinda bad. They weren't even that great of characters either, none of them had any sort of development or character arcs, but it's just when compared to literally any of the others we've come across so far in this game, it sucks to lose the only ones that actually stood out. Fortunately, we still got Lucy in the chance. Well, kinda. Up until this point, the Dark Brotherhood has pretty much exemplified what Oblivion can do when its quests are designed to work with all of its systems. Gameplay, world design, exploration, and NPC interactions. That all pretty much goes out the window now in exchange for what fucked every other quest chain, dungeon crawls. This is the big black eye for the Dark Brotherhood questline. We are now going to be receiving our quests through dead drop locations. No more talking to people like Valtieri, Ochiva, or Lachance himself. No, we'll just be getting quests through dialogue boxes. Well, written dialogue boxes, but simple text nonetheless. We lost all those colorful personalities, lost the ability to ask guildmates for inputs on jobs, and instead just get quest markers in dungeons. So fucking lame. This part smacks of filler, and while there's plenty of in-game reasoning for this part, Dead drops are more secret and more secure, and really does make you feel like the lone assassin out in the field. I just have such a bad taste in my mouth from three long quest chains already beating us over the head with drawn out excessive dungeon crawls. Having some of the most intricately designed quests in the game coupled with a great base of operations filled with interesting characters all yanked away at the same time really spoils the experience for this stretch of the quest. As a result, I'm going to plunge through this pretty quickly because there just isn't much to discuss. If it isn't for the story that the designer manages to weave all this filler into, this would have been enough to sink the Dark Brotherhood below the Thieves Guild, which had not a single quest that felt like filler. But this all ends up serving a purpose, so this is just a bitter pill that has to be swallowed. The first dead drop quest has us killing a necromancer who is attempting to turn himself into an immortal lich. Now, this would have been an excellent premise for a Mage's Guild quest, because stopping a necromancer from becoming an immortal undead seems like something that they ought to be worried about. But instead it falls to the Dark Brotherhood to do it, and it just seems very out of place. They let us assassinate him by simply pickpocketing an item off of him, killing him instantly as it holds his life force as he transforms, but that's about all the assassiny stuff going on here. It's a lame quest and isn't really worth much getting into. The next quest is, in theory anyway, much better. We are tasked with wiping out an entire family. Now this is the stuff the Dark Brotherhood lives for. We know the location of the matriarch of the family and nothing else, so we go pay her a visit and the senile old lady believes we are a courier for a gift delivery service and not an assassin looking to wipe her family out. So she gives us a list of all the locations of her children and makes the job of hunting them down all but completely trivial. It just becomes a matter of following quest markers and finding ways of getting rid of them. She's probably the real highlight of the quest as the rest of them lack any interesting dialogue. So we kill her first. And then it's on to going down the list. One daughter is a recluse living in a cave with some wild animals, making her the easiest to kill with no witnesses. One owns an inn with an imperial soldier constantly posted in there, but with the right angle and a sneak attack, he's removed. Another works as a guard for Umbakano in the imperial city, and I didn't even bother trying to find an appropriate way to kill him, I just attacked him in the basement of his employer's mansion and took the bounty for the assault. Finally, the last daughter is a guard in Lyowin and patrols the streets alone. Unable to kill her in one shot, we end up incurring a significant bounty for this one because she managed to telepathically report the crime before dying, I guess. I don't really know or care because I know what's waiting for us now that this whole family is dead. I had a whole segment dissecting the next few assassination dead drops, but honestly, they are just all so dull and straightforward it's just not worth getting into. 
The lack of bonuses, because those disappeared with the dead drops, really begins to show, and these quests just become a matter of going to the quest markers and making the target dead. There is very little thought needed, and some of them you won't even attract attention from the guards if you're caught fighting them in the streets because they paid off the city guards to look the other way. It's literally just, go here and fight this person. It feels more like the arena than the Dark Brotherhood, so rather than going through this piece by piece and seeing this video hasn't had a montage yet, let's just do it that way instead. I thought I could get here in time! Thought I could stop you! By Sithis, what have you done? What madness has claimed you? You have betrayed me. You have betrayed the Dark Brotherhood. Why? I am here to end your miserable life. To... but... I can see the confusion in your eyes. You... You have no idea what I'm talking about. Do you? So, we've been duped and just murdered like half the Black Hand, including the listener himself. The Black Hand knew they were being hunted, which explains why they were getting increasingly more difficult, luring us into more elaborate traps and remote locations. It's an interesting way to retroactively reframe the previous few quests, and totally caught me by surprise the first time I did the quest. So we didn't give up all that made the previous half of the quest chain great for nothing. We at least got a sweet plot twist that doesn't feel completely invented. Now it's time to hunt down the traitor and bring this madness to an end. Lucien has us go and wait at the next dead drop location to see who shows up next to drop off the orders. Which I don't really know why he thinks the orders aren't already there, but okay. We head to the city of Anvil and arrive just at the right time to catch the false orders being dropped off by an intermediary. He claims a man in robes who lives in the lighthouse paid him to drop the orders off, and that's all he knows. Well, he also knows the lighthouse cellar stinks like something died down there and suggests we check it out. Doing so reveals something out of a horror story. This is most certainly the home of the traitor. The place is full of corpses of tortured victims ranging from animals to humans and a lone crazed dog presumably feasting on the rotting corpses left to guard the place. We then find a shrine with a severed head simply titled Mother's Head at its center and the diary of the traitor is written in what seems like blood. It details everything he's been doing to undo the Dark Brotherhood for revenge of the murder of his mother. When he was young, his father contracted the Dark Brotherhood to murder his wife and Lucien Lechance was the one who carried out the murder chopping off the traitor mother's head right in front of him as he hid under the bed. Since then, he swore revenge on his father and the Dark Brotherhood and Lucy and Lachance. It seems his first murder was his father. Eventually, he ends up joining the Dark Brotherhood himself, working at the Shaden Hall Sanctuary. He rose up the ranks of the guild, even falling in love with a fellow guildmate. But when he told her how he likes to keep the severed head of his dead mother around, she understandably was a little freaked out. So he does the only thing a well-adjusted psychopath does and kills her. He then starts killing random people in his cellar and kills everyone aboard a ship in the Anvil Harbor. He continues rising the ranks until he has made the silencer for one of the members of the Black Hand. He eventually commits a murder in his quest for revenge that almost blows his cover and this is how they learn that there's a traitor among their ranks. 
he ends up figuring out how to use Lucian's dead drops to get us to start murdering the Black Hand, all in hopes that eventually they will call an emergency meeting with the Night Mother. Being a member of the Black Hand himself, he will then be able to have an audience with the Night Mother herself and slight her, ending the Dark Brotherhood for good. It's really interesting how someone noble like Adamus Filda wasn't able to even make a dent in the Brotherhood's operations. But a completely sadistic, unhinged psychopath, even by the standards of Dark Brotherhood psychopaths, is able to bring the organization to the brink of total destruction through his systemic and planned actions from within. It's a brilliant juxtaposition that shows the strengths and weaknesses of an organization such as the Dark Brotherhood, and it's all completely believable. This is one of the only antagonists in the entire game we actually get to learn about, and in some ways sympathize with. I can't really blame him for wanting to destroy the Dark Brotherhood. And not actually being a psycho killer myself, I even support his efforts to some extent. With the truth now known, it's time for us to go meet up with Lucy and the Chance at the remote farm we agreed to meet at. But when we get there... Silencer, at last you've arrived. Fear not, for the crisis that has threatened the Dark Brotherhood has finally come to an end. I am Arquin, speaker for the Black Hand. As you can see, we have dealt with the betrayer, Lucian the Chance. No longer will you serve as his puppet. It seems the Chance wanted revenge against the Dark Brotherhood for some reason, and used you to do his dirty work. These people have no idea Lachance was innocent, and unfortunately we don't actually know the true identity of the killer just yet, though it is likely it is one of these five. As they all have seemed to enjoy torturing Lachance, it's not very obvious who the true killer is. And just as he had hoped, we will now be seeking the Night Mother's guidance for waking her in her secret crypt. Even though we are promoted to Speaker of the Black Hand to replace Lachance, we really have no way of discerning who the traitor among this group is. Although we know he's a man, so I think we could have at least ruled out Arquin and explained the truth to her. Would that have made a difference? Eh, I don't really know. It sounds like this I really yearn for actual meaningful dialogue options in this game, but we're stuck on this railroad, might as well take it to the end. I can't help but just feel sorry for Lucian. He was an evil bastard like everyone else in this guild, but he was no traitor and died a disgraceful death. He knew he was being framed, but still there wasn't anything he could really do outside of the precautions he had already been taking. I've seen a lot of people mention this, but it is worth repeating. The corpse we see here is just one of the generic zombie corpses we see throughout the game, especially in Necromancer Caves and Oblivion Gates. Only this one isn't colored green, and that's enough to make us able to identify it as a chance, giving our imagination enough to picture how grisly his death really was. It's a great example of the subtle power of visual storytelling in video games, and is something Oblivion is able to leverage from time to time. With the right context and build-up, devs are able to make us think and feel certain things with just a few carefully placed environmental details. It's something video games in particular are able to do very well. Well, it's time to finally meet the Night Mother and hopefully bring an end to this madness. At least with us knowing the truth, maybe there's still some hope. We did, after all, manage to single-handedly dismantle most of the Black Hand. So, it stands to reason we can preserve what's left of it. Especially since the traitor does not know that we know the truth now. Arquin performs the ritual before the statue of the lucky old lady in Breville, revealing a trap door to the crypt of the Night Mother. In another stroke of interesting recontextualization, the devs have given new meaning to a familiar location, which I'm a real sucker for as I said earlier. The statue transforms from a welcoming symbol of love and charity into some nightmarish horror as the statue literally screams. Down in the crypt though, things don't go so well. Ah uh, yes, I have been expecting you. The listener now kneels by Sithis as does his successor. There is a traitor amongst you. The traitor is dead, dear mother. We have come now to ask your blessing. Anoint one of us your listener so we can restore the Black Hand. Foolish little girl. Lucian Lachance served Sithis to his dying breath. The Black Hand is Enough. tainted by betrayal. Enough of this. Restoration is you impossible. will all suffer for the pain you have caused me. I will destroy your Night Mother, and the Dark Brotherhood will fall. Ow! Huh. <laughs> what treachery! The traitor still lives. It is Matthew Bellamont. Do not let him harm the Night Mother. Kill him! <laughs> never take me down! Well, the traitor is dead, but so is all but two members of the Black Hand. This definitely complicates the recovery of the Dark Brotherhood. But the Night Mother admits she knew all along about the traitor's intentions since he was a child and swore his revenge. 
She refused to intervene though because if her listener and her speakers couldn't see the truth, then they just aren't very good at their jobs and shouldn't be rewarded. Instead, she let them get dismantled, knowing full well that the traitor wouldn't succeed and we'd be the one to end his life. Because of that, she chooses us to be her new listener. Well, I guess that's one way to earn a promotion, just let a traitor murder all of your competition. Once again, in a little bit of self-aware irony, the Night Mother herself basically says this all happened because the leaders of the Dark Brotherhood had grown complacent and incompetent. It's the exact same thing that almost led to the destruction of the Mages Guild and the Fighters Guild. Apparently, Guild and Cyrodiil all suffer from really bad leadership. Only here, the Night Mother recognizes such and just lets the roster be purged so she could replace them all with better talent. Well, I guess that's one way to restructure an organization. Let a traitor purge everyone unfit for their positions and let the best of those remaining take out the traitor and make them the new leaders. The Night Mother lets us loot her crypt, happy as can be that she has a new listener, even if the rest of her organization is dangerously weakened now. Once we got our fill, she transports us back to the Shaden Hall Sanctuary, and that's more or less the end of the quest line for the Dark Brotherhood. We can technically perform a weekly ritual where we receive the list of those looking to make contracts with the Dark Brotherhood, but this is an unending quest, and it's just there to make us feel like we are indeed the listener of the Dark Brotherhood. I mean, I gotta give them credit for putting this in, as none of the other guilds had any sort of post-quest line content that lets us at least try and roleplay as the heads of the other guilds. With those, we just get the highest title, and that's pretty much it. But, don't be fooled, this is just some flavor content and really not much else. Arkwin will hold down the fort at the Sanctuary, trying to recruit and rebuild it following the Purge, and presumably find new members to fill out the Black Hand once more. But, other than that, our time of the Dark Brotherhood is at an end, bringing with it the end of the major guild quests. It's difficult to come up with some general blanket statement to summarize all the guild content. Some of it is great, some of it is terrible, with most of it landing somewhere between those two extremes. When things are going well, the quest designs are trusting the player to figure things out on their own, simply presenting an objective and telling the player to use what they know to get it done. When the quests are at their absolute worst, you're being sent into boring dungeons filled with generic enemies we've fought a dozen times already just to find some story item or NPC that delivers us exposition, and then has us return to the quest giver for that story exposition to be tossed aside faster than it had been dumped on us. The inconsistent nature of all this makes it difficult to recommend to newcomers unless we warn them what to avoid. But even the great stuff doesn't do anything particularly exceptional, it's just brilliant compared to what else is in the game. But I think I've spent more than enough time covering the guilds. It's time to move on to another chunk of quest content, the Daedric Shrines. In Oblivion and the Elder Scrolls games in general, the player will often cross paths with certain entities known as Daedric Princes. These beings are, for a lack of a better description, gods. More specifically, they were gods who did not take part in the creation of the world and therefore maintained their more concrete forms and powers, as opposed to the Aedra who sacrificed or tricked depending on the creation story to create the world of mortals. Daedra and Daedric Princes are generally seen as demonic and evil, although that label is not wholly true. Most of them seem to just be completely apathetic to the going-ons of the mortals, and only interfere when it serves to amuse or benefit them. Even the more benevolent princes tend to fall into this pattern of behavior. There are 17 Daedric Princes, but only 15 of them have shrines in Oblivion. Each shrine allows us to make an offering to the prince, who will then communicate to us a task they wish to have completed if they are going to bestow upon us their blessing. Some of these quests are genuinely interesting, and while all of them lack in comparison to some of the great quests in the Thieves Guild and Dark Brotherhood, they are still interesting in their own right. But unlike any of the other quests in the game, whose only rewards tend to be the experiences themselves, the shrines actually grant us some of the best gear in the game, with the final quest for Hermes Moore being a book of exceptional power granting huge amounts of levels to skills of our choosing. I'm going to go through each quest, but seeing as most of them are the same go here and kill X objectives, we've already seen a trillion times at this point, I'll gloss over them very quickly. Starting with Azura, who is one of the not-so-demonic princes of the Pantheon, her task is rather benevolent in premise. Some of her followers would turn into vampires in service to her and lock themselves in a cave to avoid causing havoc in their feral forms. She asks us to go there and mercy kill all of them. It's a dungeon crawl through a generic cave, but completing it gives us Azura Star, a rechargeable soul gem of the highest power level. It's absolutely worth the few minutes it takes to complete her quest. 
Boethia is one of my personal favorites to complete, but getting to his shrine is a real bitch as it's deep in the mountains to the east. His quest has us participating in a tournament fight to the death, where we go up against a member of each race in the game. This quest is fantastic for gear when done at higher levels, as each opponent we face is generally armed to the teeth and stocked up on a stupid amount of potions and arrows. I would recommend coming here with as little weight as possible and plenty of feather potions and spells. It's a great quest to stock up on some consumables and for some mid to late game gearing up. The weapon we get at the end of the quest, Goldbrand, is also a very nice weapon if you're using one-handed blade weapons. Clavicus Vile tasks us, or rather strikes up a bargain as he prefers to see it, to retrieve the Sword of Umbra. Umbra is a pretty awesome sword with a Soul Trap enchantment on it, and if you get it prior to the end of the quest, it weighs nothing, which makes it even better. Retrieving the sword involves fighting the female warrior who now goes by the name of the sword, as its power seems to have driven her insane on some level. Fighting her at a very low level is, uh, challenging. But being able to use her sword for a while and wear her armor is well worth the effort. Vile's companion, Barbus, will offer us an alternative to turning the sword over to Vile. He suggests we refuse to hand the sword over to him because it's not something Vile should possess. If we turn in the sword, we are rewarded with the Mask of Clavicus Vile, a cool-looking heavy armor helmet of decent protection with a rather worthless fortified personality enchantment on it. Keeping the sword is okay, but it goes from weighing nothing to weighing 40 pounds, so it loses a lot of its appeal. I end up turning over the sword, but I really have no use for either reward. The mask just looks more interesting, I guess. Here's seen is the Lord of Hunting, and tasks us with hunting down the last unicorn. He directs us to a grove where the unicorn is being protected by some minotaurs. It's a relatively simple quest, though the unicorn can be a bit tricky to kill just because it's got some high resistances and has a very powerful attack. The model of the unicorn itself is a little unique, but it really is just the same horse model we've seen throughout the game with a white texture and a horn attached to it. Regardless, Hirsin wants it dead, so that's exactly what we do, taking the horn as proof. As a reward, we are given Savior's Hide, which is a very nice light armor chest with a magic resistance enchantment. Lord Drad took my ogres. Says he owns them. Lying maggot! They're my ogres! Malakoth is upset that some of his ogres are being used as slave labor in a mine, and has us free them from their captivity. There are a few routes we can take with this quest, ranging from just storming the place and killing everyone in there, to sneaking through picking the locks on the cells and turning the ogres loose on their captors. Once all the cells have been opened, we can return to the shrine and be rewarded with Volengrung, a quite powerful two-handed blunt weapon with a paralyzed enchantment on it. Very nice for cheesing enemies. Mafala sets us to creating strife in a peaceful community where Nords and Dunmer have successfully coexisted for a while. But, under the appearance of tranquility is deep-seated racism and resentment common between Nords and Dunmer. This quest would have been much more interesting if it had multiple routes to sowing the seeds of chaos, but in reality there's only one way to get it done. Steal the evidence that would incriminate the other family, murder the leaders of each group, and then plant the respective evidence on the corpses. This will then trigger an all-out slaughter between the families until one is just completely eliminated. In this playthrough, the Dunmer survived. Very good. Once one of the families is dead by the hands of the other, Mafala awards us with Ebony Blade, which is pretty much identical to Goldbrand, but with the Silence and Absorb Health enchantment instead of a Fire enchantment, making it really powerful. Meridia wants us to wipe out some necromancers because we, we, we just haven't had enough of those quests, right? She gives us the Ring of the Khajiit, which is a very nice ring for stealth characters as it gives an awesome chameleon effect to make sneaking even more brokenly powerful, and a fortify speed buff for us speed demons who just want to go really, really fast. Molag Baal's quest is one of the more interesting ones, as it doesn't really hold our hand and just tasks us with provoking a former knight who has forsworn violence into attacking us with the cursed mace. When we travel to the town he lives nearby, the townsfolk shed some light on the man's character explaining that he took an oath of non-violence when his wife died of a sudden fever when he was away fighting. He now lives in solitude on the edge of town, spending most of his time at his wife's grave. Trying to provoke him even by attacking him yields no results. We have to wait for him to visit his wife's grave, where he will then be vulnerable to breaking his vow. If we drop the mace in front of him and attack him by the grave, his anger takes hold of him and he picks up the mace and starts attacking us. Once we are dead, we will be teleported back to the shrine where Moloch Baal congratulates us on damning yet another soul. He then rewards us with the Mace of Moloch Baal, which has some nifty little enchantments that makes it a decent weapon for one-handed blunt characters. 
No. You're dead. I killed you myself. What manner of creature are you? Will I be tormented with your image forever? Namir is a charming prince who loves squalor and filth. We gotta get our personality down to a very low threshold before beginning the quest, but apparently we've become such a despicable person since doing the Dark Brotherhood quest that we are welcomed at the shrine with open arms. She expresses outrage that a group of priests are trying to help her followers who live in total darkness and filth in some ruins. She gives us a spell that will help us deal with those pesky priests and lets us loose. In the old ruins, we find priests holding torches trying to quite literally bring light to these people. Namira's followers are afraid of the light and hide when the priests are nearby with their torches. We have other plans though, and with our spell we are able to extinguish the torches. Once in the dark, Namira's followers spring from the darkness and slaughter the powerless priests. It's a very perverse premise for a quest, and I find it to be one of the more memorable and enjoyable ones, if not short and insanely easy. As a reward, we are given the Ring of Namir, which is insanely powerful with its Reflect spell and Reflect damage enchantments. I love using this ring on mage characters coupled with some spell absorption. Nocturnal I already covered when I talked about the Skeleton Key in an earlier video. A couple of thieves stole her eye, which she uses to uncover secrets, and hid it in a cave. The quest just involves us eavesdropping on the two thieves to uncover the hiding location, getting down there, retrieving the eye, and then returning it to the shrine. As a reward, we get an unbreakable lockpick, which just completely nullifies the security skill. It's just an absolute essential for almost any character. Parite's quest is a forgettable trump through a forgettable plane of oblivion. His followers accidentally stun lock themselves trying to perform a summoning ritual of the prince, and Parite, already embarrassed for being known as the weakest of the princes, wants his followers' souls unstuck from the planes of his realm, which look identical to the realms of Mehrun's Dagon, because they really couldn't be bothered to give this guy a unique realm. It's a lot of navigating difficult to navigate land and fighting the same dull Daedra we fought untold scores of during the main quest. He rewards us with Spellbreaker, which is perhaps one of the most powerful items in the game with its absurdly high reflect spell enchantment. For being the weakest of the princes, he does have a sweet shield. Sheryl Gorath's quest is by far the most memorable and most fun. While all the other shrines had us making offerings of simple things like animal pelts, glow dust, and nightshade, Shergorth's followers insist on a very specific set of items to coax the crazy prince into talking to us. We need a head of lettuce, a lesser soul gem, and some yarn. Why? Who knows? It's a sort of unknowable randomness that makes Shergorth such a charming and frustrating prince to deal with. It tells us of a settlement of Khajiit on the border of elsewhere whose citizens believe in a very specific prophecy that would signal the end of the world. Shogorath has a simple request. Make that prophecy come true. Speaking with the town shaman reveals the three signs of the end times. First would be a plague of rats, where an infestation of rats would overrun the town. Then there would be a plague of famine, where all the town's livestock would die in their pens. Finally, a plague of fear, which the shaman won't reveal because it's just that scary. For the rats, we find out the innkeeper has a lovely collection of cheeses one of which smells so potent it needs to be locked up in a glass case. So we steal that cheese and stick it in a cooking pot in the center of town, and the smell is so strong it attracts a swarm of rats in the town. Step one of the prophecy is now fulfilled. The shaman begins placing rat poison all over town, so we steal some of it and place it in the feet of the livestock. This leads to all of them dropping dead in the field. Step two, now checked off. Once all that is done, Shergorth will speak directly into our minds and tell us to head into the center of town and keep our heads down. Head into the center of Border Watch, and make sure to dock. With the town sufficiently scared, they are convinced it is the end of the world and everyone starts running around the town in a panic. And we get to take one last look at our handiwork before heading back to the shrine for our reward. We are then given the Wabajack, a staff that will transform its targets into a random creature. So it could turn a very powerful monster into a harmless sheep or a little old lady into a minotaur lord. 
It's like a monster roulette and can be quite useful for downgrading difficult fights if the staff decides to roll in your favor. An amusing toy to mess with or potentially a powerful tool of destruction. An absolutely perfect item to complement the god of madness. Sanguine's quest is kind of a pain in the ass for the wrong reasons. He wants us to crash a dinner party at the castle in Lyowin by casting a certain spell on the Countess and her dinner guests. Getting into the party requires a certain level of fame, or just to be wearing items of a certain gold value. The problems start when we try to cast the spell. It's an area spell, and getting it to affect the entire party can require some trial and error. Unfortunately, casting the spell counts as assault, and the guards are very fast to stop you really only letting you cast it once before they grab you and start trying to hack you to pieces or drag you off to jail. This means you'll probably reload more than a couple times until you find the right guest you need to hit to get everyone. Once the spell works, we'll realize everyone in the room has been stripped naked, including us. We gotta run out of town with the guards chasing us, trying not to get torn apart by the guards since we lack any sort of armor. Once we're out of town, we can travel back to the shrine where Sanguine will be pleased, erasing our bounty and returning all of our items back to us. It then rewards us with Sanguine's Rose, which will summon a random Daedra that will attack the target for 20 seconds. I mean, it's alright, and it's a unique effect that can't be found anywhere else in the game, but its use is very limited and just served as the item I sacrificed for opening the portal to paradise in the main story. Farmina's quest has us retrieving her orb from a wizard who stole it from her. She directs us to his tower, where upon entering it, we find it all out of sorts and filled with Daedra. The orb has transformed his tower into a living nightmare and has also trapped him in an endless nightmare. It's a visually interesting dungeon to explore, and the reward for it is a skull of corruption. This item allows us to make exact copies of NPCs that will attack other NPCs. It's a fun little tool for creating havoc in towns that can be coupled with some other unique staves and some illusion spells to wreak some serious havoc. This just leaves Hermaeus Mora, who requires us to complete all the other shrines before we can start his. Getting to his shrine is the most arduous of them all, but at the top we get a view unlike any of the others in the game. It's a neat little touch putting the Prince of Forbidden Knowledge's shrine looking down at the rest of the world. His quest is also a unique one. He wants us to collect souls from all of the races in the game. This basically just means finding members of each race, casting the unique soul trap spell on them, and then killing them. The easiest way to do this is just to travel between all the shrines and sacrificing their souls to the prince. This is ideal because all 10 races are represented throughout the shrines. These NPCs are completely useless to us now, and they are all in remote places, so murdering them won't incur any bounties. We could also hunt down bandits and vampires if we don't want to resort to murdering NPCs, but in the spirit of performing a task for Daedric Prince, I opted for the murder route. Once we got one of every soul, we returned to the shrine for the reward. We are given Agma Infinium, a powerful skill book that allows us to pick one of three paths. The Path of Steel, the Path of Shadow, or the Path of Spirit, correlating to the more familiar combat, stealth, and magic roles, respectively. This then boosts two of the related attributes and three of the related skills by 10 points each. A very useful item for the last few difficult to attain levels, or for pushing skills and attributes past their max. The acquisition of Ogman's Infinium signals the end of the Daedric Shrine questline. It's a fun little diversion that often serves as a nice capstone following the major quest content of the game, while also showering the player in gear that really ought to have been more integrated into the quest instead, as these short and simple tasks provide much better rewards than most of the major quests in the game. You were right about one thing, though. This is my game, and I'm changing the rules. There are quite a few side quests that we can pick up throughout the world that aren't affiliated with any sort of guild or faction. These are usually just little standalone adventures that sometimes have a little story attached to them, and sometimes not. This is pretty much what I would consider the cutting room floor of content for Oblivion. What we get as side quests mostly should never have seen the light of day, but in an attempt to add more to the world that feels quite barren of things to do outside of what we've already explored, Bethesda squeezed these in. Some of these quests are so bad they make the Mages Guild quests look good in comparison, while most of them are just mind-numbingly bland and forgettable. I'm not going to go into most of them because that would just be a tremendously tedious and boring diversion. Some of them are worth looking at as they are genuinely decent or just so horrible they deserve a look at as a cautionary example of how to not make a quest in this game. We'll start things off in the city of Anvil where we find a totally trustworthy fellow selling a mansion in town for real low cheap. 
He says he needs to sell the place quick to finally tie up his loose ends in Anvil and move to the Imperial City, so he's willing to let the place go for such a song. Smelling a great opportunity to get in on the ground level of a clearly up-and-coming neighborhood, we part with the 5,000 gold and get the deed to our new place. It's not much to look at, but Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither is a real estate empire. All the thoughts of future investment opportunities has us tired, though, so it's time to catch some shut-eye. We are startled awake by a sudden chill in the air, only to find three ghosts in the room with us. A struggle for survival ensues, and only when all three ghosts are defeated does it dawn on us. This place is haunted! That's why it was so cheap. The rest of the quest has us tracking down the seller and having him help us lift the curse on the place. The original owner and the source of the curse was a long distant relative of his who became a hermit and began dabbling in the dark magics. He eventually succeeded in turning himself into a lich who we accidentally awaken when we break into his secret crypt in the basement of the house. It's actually a really interesting and unique quest by Oblivion standards that helps add a little flair to one of the houses we can purchase in the game and was really not something I expected to stumble across when I first played through the game, and I was like, oh shit, I can buy a mansion? It's not long or intricate, but it's great for adding some much needed flavor to a game that, for the most part, can feel lacking in the adventure department. Especially when it's got quest chains like the Mage's Guild that feels more like busy work rather than exciting adventure. Stumbling across something like this, something so easily missed, creates this feeling of discovery. An unexpected voyage falls along similar lines as the mansion quest, as it has us being taken out to sea aboard a ship turned in once we spend a night in one of its rooms. It turns out a crew of pirates hijacked the inn, managing to set it to sea in an attempt to buy some time to locate a rumored treasure hidden somewhere aboard. It's a dumb easy quest, probably fit for a level 1 character, but there's some amusing dialogue, and emerging from below deck to see we are quite literally out at sea is a neat little trick. This is one of those simple little quests that use the context of its premise to sell an otherwise ordinary and easy to make world space, and ends up creating a neat 10 minute diversion that ends up feeling more rewarding and interesting than the more elaborate quests in Oblivion. Some of the more memorable side quests stand out simply because they take us to some interesting locales. Through a Nightmare Darkly for instance takes us to another Nightmare Realm, but one that is more interesting than the one we went to for an Amira's quest. Here we are helping a fellow Mage's Guild member rescue her friend from a dream world of his own creation. Turns out he got stuck there and forgot certain aspects of himself, so we are required to perform four tests. A test of perception, a test of resolve, a test of courage, and a test of patience. Each test has some sort of puzzle-like objective associated with it. Nothing mind-bending, but it's a nice little tromp through a unique looking setting. Brush with Death has us looking for a famous painter who's gone missing. Turns out he managed to get himself stuck in a painting he was making because his paintbrush is, in fact, magical and allows him to make great art without any effort or creativity on his part. The quest itself is brain dead simple as it just has us fighting some trolls, but it's the world that we get transported to that makes it noteworthy. I said in an earlier video, Oblivion has this painted sort of aesthetic to it. Well, this world takes that idea literally. But the locale is really all that's worth noting about this quest, so let's move on. Canvas the castle has is getting involved in an investigation to find a painting that had been stolen in Castle Coral. The Countess charges us with tracking the painting down and bringing the thief to justice. It's noteworthy as it actually gives us a few choices and is relatively open-ended. The Countess gives us a list of people to talk to, some keys and permission to all the areas in the castle, and says go find the painting. It's a refreshing break from the usual quest marker following most of the other side quests tend to be, and has us connecting albeit very few dots to come up with a suspect. A little love triangle is exposed, and we end up having the option to turn in the thief or not. But any list of great open-ended Oblivion quests would be invalid without mentioning paranoia. There's a wood elf named Glarthir in Skingrad whom everyone thinks is a little, uh, odd. He accosts us and enlists our aid in exchange for lots of gold. His whole thing is that he believes there is some sort of conspiracy against him in town, and he wants us to uncover evidence of it being true or not. Really, he's just asking for us to tell him he's right. Each time we meet in the secret spot behind the chapel at night, he gives us a name of a suspect and details why he believes they are suspect. Usually it's because he thinks they stare at him too long or something. So he asks us to follow them, see what they're doing, who they are talking to, and report back to him. Now, we could do our due diligence and trail our targets, but the game doesn't actually force us to do any of that. There's never a point where a message box pops up and says, okay, looks like they aren't suspect. Meaning we can just lie and tell them whatever we want. So really, that just means one thing. 
The best thing to do is confirm his worst suspicions and tell him that each suspect is indeed part of a conspiracy and that he's totally onto something. And so it all falls into place. Yes, yes, it all makes sense now. Here, this is your last task. Here's the gold, as promised. I always pay my debts and then some. Do the last task in that note, and I will pay you much, much more. This eventually drives him over the edge, and he gives us one last task, which is to murder who he believes is the ringleader of the entire conspiracy. From here, we got three options. Actually murder the NPC, turn Glarthir over to the guards, or tell the target about Glarthir's madness and let street justice be carried about. Being an agent of chaos, I naturally choose the last option. But there's no right or wrong way of handling this quest. And if we end up breaking into Galarthia's house, we find all sorts of clues into his madness and get a sense of just how long he's been concocting this conspiracy theory. It truly is a fantastic quest that makes good use of the layered systems Bethesda built and helps do some of the world building and characterization I can't get enough of when quests do it right in Oblivion. It lets us choose whatever path we want to choose without impediment or judgment. It's truly a one-of-a-kind quest in this game that has me making a save before starting it just so I can try different things to see how the game will react. But I guess it's about time to finally put the quests to bed. We've been going through them for two videos now, looking at some of the best and worst Oblivion has to offer. There's a few other side quests that are notable for one reason or another, but I've beaten a point to death long enough. When I started, I said there's something of a pattern or a formula a lot of Oblivion's quests follow. A template, perhaps. The problem with quests in this sort of game is that conventional wisdom might lead someone to think that quests in general are a violation of the underlying design philosophies of the game. A game that's all about player freedom, freedom to explore, freedom to develop, and freedom to interact with the world however the player wants, wouldn't be able to work with something as restrictive as quests. This is where buzzwords like emergent gameplay might start to pop up as designers and players alike believe these games can only be enjoyable when the player is the one in the driver's seat making their own stories and their own fun. I disagree with that notion though. What always stuck out as the better quests were the ones that utilized certain parts or all the parts of the game's sandbox. Quests like Paranoia Who Done It has the player toying with the Radiant AI, trying to figure out NPC habits. Many Thieves Guild quests, while not designing the quests entirely around those AI routines, still implemented them to create immersive mini-puzzles the player had to work through in order to successfully complete jobs. These quests might ask players to utilize aspects of stealth, combat, persuasion, and a little bit of problem-solving and detective work to see things get done. They might just pose an open-ended objective, build a small slice of the Oblivion sandbox, and then tell the player, use what you got and what you know to get it done. All of those quests end up being the most enjoyable gameplay-wise. I understand those are also the most difficult quests to design as they require a ton of testing to make sure things don't break, but it's also acceptable if they only create the illusion of total openness and instead, there's really only a few paths that are open for the player to explore. So long as there are options available and an aspect of exploration, it will be a million times more rewarding than the duller formula we see a whole lot more of in Oblivion. That formula usually devolves into either running around chasing quest markers that lead us by the nose from one scripted dialogue or combat sequence to another scripted event, being fed piecemeal, dull exposition heavy dialogue spewed from characters we barely know and don't care to know because they are just disposable vehicles for this dialogue. Or even worse, we are given an objective like kill all the enemies in a dungeon or go into a dungeon and retrieve an item. This just places the burden of creating the quest content onto the player instead of leaving it in the hands of the game designer. The dungeon diving quests are some of the laziest and cheapest forms of quests in Oblivion, and probably the most plentiful as well. It sidesteps the issue of how do we make a quest that any player of any playstyle can complete by just replacing all the challenge with a dull combat experience we can get on our own by just loading into one of the 200 dungeons floating around in the wilderness. It's the simplest and least rewarding solution to that omnipresent problem the designers always seem to be plagued by. And I believe they overestimated that problem, though. When looking at the two best guilds in the game, we can see that it's rather simple to compel the player to play through quests a certain way. 
It's fine if the designers make quests that necessitate stealth, murder, and theft, so long as the gameplay experience is fun and rewarding when the player sticks to those predefined paths. The player most likely will be fine with playing a more restrictive slice of the game if it gives them an experience they can't get anywhere else in the game on their own. I can't orchestrate the deaths of an entire house full of party guests, which is why Whodunit is so much fun even though it discourages me from just walking in and butchering all of them. It's the unique gameplay options and the dialogue and just the thrill of being the puppeteer that makes the quest so enjoyable. I'm willing to roll with it because it's a rewarding experience. The designers just have to learn to trust the players and not make so many sacrifices on the altar of accessibility. We just got one last topic to cover before we hit the conclusion, and it's something altogether different. So, I'll see you in the next, where we'll cover my favorite DLC of all time.